So I actually, um, I was involved in a Guinness record. Were you? True story. So over in the Middle East, working for, <laughs> it's actually the Emir. The Emir is the king. <clears throat> and the working, king? Yeah, the, the Emir. They call the, the king of a country. Okay, they call yes. him the Emir. And uh, his brother, who was never going to be the king, so yeah. he just lived life and pretty full. He was into uh, speedboats, but I'm talking like Formula One type speedboats, open top, wow, real quick. And uh, yeah, so I had to do the paramedic work um, for him when he was uh, doing a, a Guinness record from Abu Dhabi to uh, Qatar. Yeah. And so I think it was something like 320 miles and it was the quickest distance on a, in an open top oh boat. Goodness. It was insane, man. Open top. <clears throat> we were in a helicopter and yeah. could barely keep up with it. That's insane. It was absolutely nuts. Wow. Absolutely nuts. Did he break it? Yeah, he, he did it. He got it. He got the he got the record. That is so cool. Yeah, he got it by about he got it by about forty minutes too. Actually, smashed it. They'd go faster than a car. Insane. Would they? Yeah, oh, insane. They're yeah. doing. They were so we were in the helicopter. We were doing about a hundred and forty knots, which is about two twenty kilometers, something yeah. like that. And he was pulling away from us. No way. Yeah, yeah. He was. He's averaging. I think he averaged something like average. Something like 230 kilometres an hour for the whole distance. That is insane. <coughs> you wouldn't have had much to do if you crashed, mate. <laughs> I said to him, I said to him um, like when we're doing the, pre the briefing and stuff like yes. this, he said, uh, oh, his team said to me, what, what happens? You know, what do you do? Because I'm in a yeah. helicopter, but, you know, we're sitting about 100 metres behind. He said, yep. I said, what do you do? And I said, I, I jumped down, you know, I, I rappel down out of the helicopter with one thing. And they said, what's that? I said, a body bag, because he's dead. Yeah. Oh. And they're going, you can't say that about, you know, this is the king's brother. Yeah. Yeah. And he starts laughing. The, 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 the king's brother just starts laughing. Hilarious. I That's said, mate, cool. you, you come out of that boat at 230 kilometres an hour. Yeah. I said, you're cooked. You're done. Far out. Yeah. Yeah, there's just no hope. Nah. Yeah. You, you hit the yeah. water and be like, it's it's like hitting concrete. It is. Yeah. So, yeah, that was pretty oh, insane. Oh, my goodness. That's so cool. Yeah. So there you go. Far out. That's a cool story. I like that. Sean. Thank you so much for joining us on the Thoughts on Purpose podcast. It's incredible to have you here. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. It's great to be here. Excellent, excellent. So this is Pastor Sean White, Senior Pastor at C3 Hobart, and we're gonna we're gonna dive into a conversation today. And we just began a little little snippet of something, and I, I was like, we've got to record this because <laughs> <laughs> before we get too carried away. No, um, looking for, really looking forward to this. Amazing. Really looking amazing. forward to it. Thank you for being here. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Excellent. So I I was actually journaling. I've brought my journal with me. I usually have a note, uh, an iPad, but I brought my journal because I wrote some notes specifically about you because I was just taking some time in silence today. And I was like, what are the things I admire about you? Because I was very called, like very called to sit down with you. Um, there's just certain people who I just feel this energy toward and you were one of them. Wow. And I was thinking what that was. And I'm going, to, I'm going to read these things, so hopefully this is okay with you. Please, yeah. So the things that inspire me about you, that I've really felt drawn to, it was your dedication to your mission, because we've been coming to C3 Hobart on and off for about almost two years now. And every time I've seen you, I've interacted with you, it's just very evident that you are someone who is very dedicated to your mission. And your mission is a mission of service, let me just say that. Like, it's, it's yeah. a mission of service, that's what I'm sensing. And you're a humble leader. I, I've always had a, I guess, a bit of a knack for observing people. It's just what I do, sort of why I do the work I do as well. Um, but I, I remember seeing you in, in the men's night and you were there cleaning out the rubbish bins. And I saw that and I was like, I'm not sure if you even remember doing that. But I saw you doing that, I was like, that is cool. Like here you are, senior pastor of a church. And that just spoke volumes to me. I was like, that is, that's a leader. You know, and, wow. and I, I really admired that. You're not afraid to roll up your sleeves and be like a part of the community. It's, there's none of this, I'm the pastor, you're the people. It's like, we're the people. Sure. That's what I'm sensing. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, a couple of things that I've, I've Thank felt, you. felt about you, man. Thank you. Let, let me, what an honour for you even to say that. Uh, I'm a little bit humbled by that. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the most recent books that I've read, I won't. I read all the time, but one of the most recent books that I read that stands out to me was one by um, Simon Sinek, mm. and it's Leaders Eat Last. 
Beautiful. And I, I just love that understanding. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things when you read a book, I, I find an advantage. If you read a book, if you can get 20% out of it, then I think it's worth reading the book. You know, there's not going to be this every single thing you're going to totally agree with. But some of the mentality he had around there of, and he was talking military, if you haven't read the book, it's, he's talking about the military service. But it's about that understanding that leaders sometimes need to eat last. Yeah. And um, I've shared before, I've actually preached a message before on, on leadership, especially in a church sense. And when I talk church sense here, this, this can be relatable to any business or anything like this. And one of the things that as I stepped into the ministry, and I'll, I'll share about that later on, but I've been ministering here uh, or been the pastor here for about four and a half years alongside my wife. And... Um, one of the things that I observed is that as a leader, sometimes you need to lead from the front. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm not a great cyclist, but I do cycle a little okay. bit. And we cycle with a guy in our church who, who rode for Australia. So, I mean, he's, he's very good. Yes. And he will often lead from the front, you know, especially going up the hills where he's breaking the ground. He's taking in the charge. He's taking the hits for others in a way. Yeah. And you're leading from the front and, you know, you're sort of filing in behind and you, you want to push and keep going. But then there's times when he would lead from behind and sometimes it's on a flat road and you just feel this little gentle hand in your back. And it Often in our society, we don't understand that that's leadership as well. Mm. We think that the leader has to be at the front all the time, taking the hits, doing this stuff. Sometimes the greatest leadership is when you're behind and you're helping others and power forward. And, and Ooh, so that. I've just always taken that mentality. Sometimes the greatest leadership I can show is emptying a bin, vacuuming mm. the floor, doing the dishes, you know, being the last to leave. Not always, yeah. but you know, that's just one of the leadership philosophies that I have. You know, and whether it's leading a church or, or a group or whatever it might be, I think it, it's it's commensurate across the, the spectrum. Mm, I love that. I love that. What, what was the biggest takeaway from Sonic, Simon Sinek's book? Was it like that same yeah, philosophy? Or? Yeah, I think, I think I just, I loved the understanding. And, and I said, I'm not military at all. Yeah. But I loved the understanding that it's about assessing the situation and knowing when is important. You're not being a martyr. You know, I'm not just doing the, the bins because look at me, you know, because yeah. that's not leadership. Yeah, and I sensed that about you. Yeah. It's dark when you were doing it. Yeah, it's just, it's just getting yeah. in and getting it done. Yeah. But it's understanding and having that purpose. And this is what I got out of that book is understanding having that purpose of by you doing this, you're inspiring somebody else. Yes. And that's the way I generally try and do this. Um, within our church structure, and you would have seen a bit of this, is yes. we're very big into empowering our next generation to take responsibility in in certainly in their faith in their spiritual faith but in elements of their life and so therefore it is if they can see that who did the bins oh well the pastor did the bins yeah. Yeah. then Fairly. it's not too big for them as well yes yes i love that i love that what would you say like as a senior <laughs> pastor what inspires you to get up in the morning now because you've achieved a lot you've succeeded like had, had an amazing amount of experience which we're going to go into but what, what now inspires you to get up in the morning? See others thrive. Yeah? Yeah. See others thrive. I think, I think we're a culture that, and don't get me wrong, there's seasons of it, but I think there's a culture where we, we tend to just survive mm-hmm. and we just get through and yes. it's kind of like lay the head on the pillow and go, oh, man, I got through that day. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there's days when, when it is the kids play up and all of this stuff. Percent. Of course. A thousand percent, yeah. But it's, it's ultimately giving people whatever field they're in um, that, that willingness and the ability to go, I can thrive through this situation. That doesn't mean you're the best, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. It does not mean you're best. Sometimes it might mean you still come last in whatever it is. But if you have the attitude to be able to thrive, in the church sense, the church is, is traditionally been a place we often think church is a place where everything is perfect and everything is well. Well, actually, it's not. It's a lot of the times it's a place where broken people come mm. because they've lost hope. They've lost hope in whatever it is. They've lost hope in humanity. Yeah. Um, humanity's created all these different idols around the world, you know, around the place, whatever yes. it might be. Yes. And and we've lost hope in what they are. And so when they come into the church sense, we want to walk the journey with people. We want to be able to take them where they're at, whether they're CEO of a multi-billion dollar company or whether they've been released from jail six weeks Mm. ago. Mm. To be able to go where you're at in your life is to be able to respect it and then go, how do we walk forward? Mm. 
And thriving for them, Nash, might be simply walking one step forward each day. Yeah. That might be thriving. Yeah. And, and and it's not setting these unrealistic goals, but just going, that might be thriving in your life. Yes, I love that. Would you would you say, like if you were to boil thriving down, would you say if you, if you were to use another word for it, would you say progressions? Like to see people progress? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. The spiritual journey, especially in my, in my field, is a spiritual journey. And, yes. and I'll talk about my professional um, career as well. Yeah, but yeah. in the spiritual journey, it's not about somebody going, right, today you've had this this understanding or this moment and tomorrow you're going to be standing on stage, you know, preaching the gospel. Of that, course, of that, course. That's, that's unrealistic for most people. It might happen, but yeah. it's unrealistic for most people. Yeah. It's, it's the same as, as when somebody walks in the door and, and, and they may be struggling with some forms of addiction, mm-hmm. uh, whatever that might be. Some people can break it like that. Some people can do it straight away. Yeah. But for others, it's about this progression of going, actually, I'm going to walk through this. And when we say addictions, we often think to ourselves of smoking, you know, drinking, drugs, mm. pornography, whatever it might mm-hmm. be. People can be addicted to anger. True. People can be addicted to lack of self-control. True. And so if thriving for them might simply be they face the same situation where previously they would have got angry, yeah. where they've just considered it and they've had a different response to it. That to me is someone progression or thriving in, in yes. what's before them. I love that. And I guess underneath that is, um, this is a great conversation. I'm enjoying this so much. And um Underneath that is everyone has the needs that they're trying to meet. They're trying to meet these fundamental needs and coming into a place like a community like this, they're getting that spiritual need met. They're getting that that need for community and support and love and connection. Like, So when they've had a reliance on a substance or a behaviour for so long that's been meeting a need in a really lousy way, when they come and step in here, I can see how some people would experience what might be a spontaneous... Um, Remission from something is that the right word? Remission. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And 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 look, it's it's an interesting topic, and yeah. uh, I'm all for technology. We're on technology course, today on yeah. this podcast. Yeah, yeah, we love yeah. it, and and yep, you know, I'll use Facebook and I'll use Instagram and all of those things there. But I think we're in a really interesting phase of society whereby we can look at these things and we can be as connected, and we've heard all this before, but we can be as connected as we can be artificially mm-hmm. yet we're we're lacking this understanding of a relationship and you talk about coming into the church building you know the structure we're in yeah, here yeah. one of the things that we try and help people thrive in is just to actually rebuild that relationship rebuild that connection um, we've all been through COVID mm. it's been tough we're still yeah, going through it uh, all my family uh, yeah. are in Melbourne and if this is going to anyone we're watching in Melbourne we're just with you guys mm-hmm. at the moment because it's tough yeah. and You know, I think one of the greatest things in speaking to some of my family and friends over there is around the the, just the disconnection with relationship that often we take for granted. That whether it be a sporting club, whether Mm. it be mums at a play group, whether it be a church based organization, is we take for granted that that relationship of just being around and that doesn't mean we have to be best buddies. But just to talk about the footy, talk about life, have a laugh. Yeah. We're built to, to, to have this relationship with each other. Scriptures actually say it. Um, right, right at the start of the scriptures in Genesis chapter, you know, the early, the early books of Genesis, yeah. it talks about the fact that God recognized that, that man shouldn't be alone. Mm. So he created someone to be with him. Why? So that there's relationship. Yeah. So that we're built to be with each other, to inspire each other, to encourage each other, to do these sort of things, to pick each other up when they're down. I love that. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. Um, let's hear a bit about your story because just before we press record, we were talking about you were <laughs> <laughs> you were paramedic and yep. you, were, you were what would you say covering um, taking care of essentially a prince? Yeah, who was, who yeah. was breaking a world record, Guinness world record. Yeah, but, but let's go. Can, can we I'll go back. back a little bit before that? Like that's, sure. that's just a little sneak peek into the sure, story sure. that's coming. <laughs> so, so I was a uh, a paramedic. Started in Western Sydney. Yes. And, um, and you grew up in Sydney? I grew up in Melbourne, okay. but my wife and I moved to Sydney when we were newly married. Yes. And up there as a paramedic. Mm. And it was in the time before you you had degrees, you know, you, you, you sort of applied for it. And to be honest, the best paramedics were, you know, 
bakers and butchers and 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 plumbers you know yes. because because they could just use their dexterity and and their yeah, abilities okay, to think outside the box yes and it was only later on that education you know formal education came into it which i did but so i grew up and, and my first posting was in western sydney which for those who know is a very you know pretty tough area mm. a fairly low socioeconomic area that mm -hmm. i worked in mm -hmm. and um a lot of things were against people and it taught me to love people even more mm. some of these people were had nothing and mm. and they were from generational of having nothing and so it was just to be able to love on them and to be able to to be able to help them in their time of crisis because mm. in ambulance is what you're doing somebody calls triple o now whether it's you've cut your finger or whether you're you know got a loved one is having a heart attack yeah they're calling you because it's a time of crisis of course and so you know, whether that's a person who's got a million dollars in the bank or they've got nothing in the bank, they still need you. Mm. So I did did um, nearly a decade in Western Sydney and uh, really enjoyed that before doing a little bit of time in uh, the nation's capital. And mm. uh, that involved some work over in places like the Solomon Islands. Um, so I was helicopter trained as well. So wow. flying over in the Solomon Islands. And before we headed to um, the Middle East, to a place called Qatar mm -hmm. and uh, for anyone who doesn't know it, have a look on a map. It's just north of Saudi Arabia and sort of to the west of Dubai. Okay. It's um, it's about eleven thousand square meters um, or square kilometers in in so it's not that big. Yeah. But it's um, at about two million people, and uh, my responsibility was as clinical director for the ambulance service over there. And All right. The very long. Uh, there's very long story to it, but I'll give you the very short version. And I've preached on this before. Mm -hmm. Um, Ten days into into my appointment over there, I've taken my wife and two girls, yes. which is significant in the fact that I took over my family of females uh, yeah, okay. into the country. Uh, and I, I can say that they were treated brilliantly. There was never an issue. They treated them so well. Amazing. They were never in fear, never looked down upon. Wow. They were treated so well. And so I'm, I'm very yeah, respectful cool. for yep. that. Yep. Ten days into it, you know, you're nervous. You're in the Middle East and... Not really sure what's going on here. And so and now you'd come straight from where had you been just before you went to the Middle East? Canberra. It was it was in Canberra. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yep. So just just straight there. Suburban paramedic in in Canberra. It's literally wow. on the plane. Twenty four hours wow. later, we're yeah. we're we're living in the and Middle had, East. Had your family visited there before? Or it was never. just like never. Like, oh my goodness. Okay. Never. We, wow. And we and literally it was the classic story of we had twenty three kilos each in a bag. Yes. We arrived there, and I remember us sitting you know in the apartment they got us they'd set us up with we're sort of all sitting there my girls were five and seven at the time yeah and my wife and i sort of looking they're going what have we done what have we done oh my goodness and it was crazy yeah it was crazy it was like oh was this just something we thought was an adventure yeah uh, but look it was the right calling we felt god was i was over this as well mm -hmm. and protected us but um yeah 10 days in uh i got a call to basically go and help the emir who is the king of the country help his grandson who had been uh shot in a hunting accident uh, oh, wow. accidentally you know it was just a pure accident yeah so i was chopped into uh, a place up north in in a private farm sort of thing and i was able to treat this this young man he, he might have been eight or nine or something around okay. there i was able to treat this young man and and Unfortunately, uh, he passed away. We did everything we could, mm. but his injuries were sustained, were, were too great. And so I remember flying back and I had to share this with the chief of staff and also with, with the emir, with the king, wow. that we had done everything we can, but his grandson had unfortunately passed away. And I remember thinking to myself, I've been 10 days in the country. Um, I'm going to tell the wife we're packing up and we're oh about to get, we're goodness. getting sent home. You know, it's been a good ten days, <laughs> but we're about to go home. Wow! And I remember the Emir spoke to me in the emergency department. They'd cleared it out because this is this is the royal family. Yeah, yeah. And he spoke to me in, in beautiful English. They're all they're all trained in in uh, universities in America and, okay. and so forth. And so beautiful English, he spoke to me and said, um, "I'll never forget what you've done." Wow! And I'm kind of going, "What does he mean by that?" Yeah. But the story goes is that then uh, I was asked to also provide emergency medical care for the royal family for the rest of my time there. Oh my so goodness. as part of the ambulance service, but we created a system that would provide protection and look after them 
for mm. a period of time. So it put me in some significant places um, and some, and I got to meet some incredible people and to provide care for them and to look after them. So it was wow. It was quite a journey. What an quite experience. My yeah. goodness, I haven't heard all that part of your story. That's interesting. Yeah. I knew you'd been overseas and everything else and uh, the uh, paramedic experience, but that's just next level. Wow. And you go back to what you said at the start, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled by what you said at the start. Mm-hmm. I treat people uh, the same. Mm. I've treated kings of countries, yeah. presidents, um, some very influential people and all credit to many of them who have worked very hard in the status that they've received and so forth. And I've treated the poorest of the poorest of the poor. Um, during the time of when Libya was, was getting overthrown from Gaddafi and there were some challenges there, we flew in there as part of a mission to be able to retrieve and help out um, many people who were in despair. Mm. In, in a situation we can't even believe. We couldn't even imagine mm. what this would be like. Yeah. And ultimately, whether you've got the title of the king, and a lot of responsibility comes with that, and I cannot more speak more highly of, of he's now the former king, but mm. of the king of Qatar, because um, of the way he treated his people was wow. just with that humility. So, But it's whether it's treating him or whether it's treating somebody who, who has got nothing and and and... You know, for them, they're living without hope. It's about providing a hope for them. And some, I just sort of felt in 21 years in my medical career that some way, somehow, I could provide a hope for them in whatever that was. Yeah. Wow. That's phenomenal. Thank you for sharing all that, first of all. Um, so much in that. I'm going to unpack a few little things uh, from it. that that really stood out for me. I loved it all. Uh, you were... Chris, like Christian yep. is the term you use. Yeah, it's Christian growing up, weren't you? So you were <clears throat> yep. fr- from a young age. And you, how old were you when you joined the paramedics? Or yeah, so so I grew up in a in a I grew up in the church. Okay, yes. Now um, my mum and dad went to church every week. Yes. Now ultimately, I had to make my own decision, as everybody does. Yeah, of course. So even though my mum and dad professed a faith and go to church yes. and you know had accepted Christ into point. their own yep. life, I like that. I I still had to make a decision yes. for myself. Yes. And so that for me was at about 16, 17, somewhere around there. Before that, I wasn't a bad person. Mm. Uh, I was going to church, but I had to make a decision for myself. And then I joined the paramedics when I was 22, 23, somewhere around there. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I I think it's really important for people to understand that although I was raised, you know, in a church family, everybody ultimately at the end of the day has to make their own that's decision. so true that's a very important point i'm a pastor of a church yeah. now yeah my children have had to make their own decision of course it, it's not something that i, I can speak life into them yeah. and i can i can but but they've got to make their own decision with thousand yeah. percent yeah and that's beautiful you did and obviously that was because when you were saying how you were working in that fairly i guess uh what was the term you used in sydney that that area you were working in how would you describe well, it was, it was a very low socioeconomic area. That's the word. Yeah, but, but yeah. you know, I mean, it's... it's. I, I saw around there is that, is that you look at these people and majority of them are living in generational challenges. Yes. And, and they don't know, a lot of them, how to break out of those things. Mm. You know, unemployment. Yeah. Uh, their father was unemployed, if they know who their father course, was. Yeah. Their father was unemployed. Yes. So they don't know what it is to put together a resume mm. to... to put a nice shirt and, and pants on and go to an interview. Yeah. Um, you know, they haven't had someone sit beside them while they try and learn how to drive a car. Mm. They haven't had someone say to them, hey, if you go and push trolleys at Woolworths, I'll teach you how to save, you know, a third of your salary, yeah. live off this. And, you know, they haven't had those things. And so I I just like to, to provide anyone I met just to be able to provide them some little element of hope of just... Give them some encouragement of whatever it might be in their life. I love that, and I, I'm certain that's what the what the king picked up on. Like it was that caring, like that that spirit of seeing everyone as equals. And it's got to be truth, the, of course. It's, of it's course. truth, truth and love. Yes, yes. The, 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 and I won't go all spiritual in this, but but I don't I, mind I think, if you do. To be no, honest. but like I think <laughs> I think what what is on my heart at the moment for yeah. the people, and, and yeah. you know, we're here in Hobart yeah. running this. What is on our heart for our community here? is to speak truth and love yes. to people. We're in a world where 
Uh, there is so much information available on your phones or on you know 24/7 news. I mean, you know, we grew up in the days where you read a newspaper and then you waited till the next day and read the newspaper. Yeah. Now it's just like you know you can check your news.com and then 10 seconds later it's changed already. Yeah, things are moving all the time. Information is moving all the time, mm-hmm. and and our job I believe is to is to instill truth and love because. We see so much, you know, I mean, American politics only had to talk about the fake news all the time. Yeah. What do we believe? What don't we believe? Mm. Whose opinions do we believe? And all of this sort of stuff. And and it's important to listen to people, but I think, you know, I want to be one who's speaking truth. I Sometimes love that. truth hurts, though. A thousand percent. Sometimes yeah. it hurts. Yeah. What's the what's the situation when the truth has hurt for like yourself or, or how, what does that look like when, when you said it? Like, I, I get what you mean, mm. but for someone who's hearing that and they're like, what does that even mean? Yeah. So for me personally, yeah, I'm going to get all personal with your viewers now. Oh, thank you. For me, it was around pride. Yeah, okay. Uh, I struggled and it wasn't a pride. It was, it was an element of pride. Yeah. I'm in the Middle East. I'm looking after the king. To be honest, my public transport was effectively a helicopter if, if I really wanted to. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, I had, uh, and in all respect to it, it's just the culture of where it was. I had drivers, you know, we had, you have gardeners, you have people do these things for you, and that's not a disrespect thing, it's actually a respectful thing to have these. And I came to Tasmania, and we'd never been to Tasmania. And I, I remember day two or day three being here, and I jumped on the metro bus, and I thought to myself, what am I doing on this, you know, sort of old rattling metro bus? <laughs> and for me, it was this pride issue yeah, inside yeah, of myself. And, and I had to, it wasn't that I was against, I came from nothing. I came from a, a, a family structure where we did it pretty tough. My, my father was a farmer. So it wasn't about that I'd ever had anything, but there was something, I, I, I realized I'd developed these little pickups inside of me that was a little bit prideful. Mm. And so... Um, yeah, I read a book by a guy called Bill Hybels, and it was called Descending into Greatness. And uh, it really stuck with me about sometimes you've got to descend in your thinking to actually um, come out the other side and, like and, that. and That's very yeah, cool. to thrive yeah. in it. Amazing. So, Do you read a lot? I like to. Yeah. Yeah, I like to. Um, I don't read, um, you know, like just a novel or anything like that. Of course. But very I, deliberate books. Yeah, yeah. Or, or articles yeah. or something like that. I'm, I'm pretty deliberate in the way yeah. I want to read. Yes. Um, my latest my latest one at the moment is, is um, by a guy called Richard Swenson called Margin. Uh, and okay. it's one of my absolute uh, pet things. If you see me in church, mostly if I'm preaching, I'll be preaching on margin because I think as a society, as we've talked about all these things in society, one of our biggest challenges, Nash, is the fact that we operate at 100% in what we do. Mm. We have seven activities for our kids. And I used to think it was it was a badge of honor to, I operated 100%. I operated 110%. Yeah. Yes. And the reality is in our life, stuff will happen. Yes. And if you've got no margin in your life, you have to deal with the stuff that happens. Ooh, I love that. Whether that be your parents going to a nursing home. Yeah. Uh, a health issue in your family, uh, a financial situation you didn't see coming. Stuff happens in life, mm. right? Yeah. And if you don't have any margin in your life, how can you deal with the stuff that happens? Yeah. Well, you do. What you end up doing is you do deal with it because you have to, but then it's taking away from something else. Mm. It takes away generally from family time. Gen- it takes away from your personal health. It takes away from the things, hobbies, fun, the things that you value in your life. Because you have to deal with the stuff that happens, yes. it takes away from the things that keep you, you know, playing golf or, or mm. whatever it is that is fun in your life. Yeah. You can do that for a season, but if you do it for too long, then all of a sudden you've removed those elements and all you end up doing is dealing with stuff in life. And so I'm about creating margin in your life. You've got to have margin in your finances, right? Yeah. Because the car will break down one day. Mm-hmm. The dog will need to go to the vet one day. Yeah. And if you don't, what do you do? You take away from the grocery bill. Yeah. You take away from these things. And and don't get me wrong, some people don't have that luxury. Don't you know, yeah. don't get me wrong with that. that. But you've got a time. We've got to create margin in our life for time. Mm. Mm, I love that. 
what's the saying? The bow too tightly strung is easy, easily snapped. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Amazing. That That's a margin. I'm going to remember that. And I, I definitely get to build more of that into my life. A uh, thousand percent. But see, um, see here's, here's the thing with it. When things are going well, we think margins are waste. <sighs> it's true. I, I had I had a couple of extra hours. I could have done something. Yes, there. yes. But what we don't do is we don't anticipate the times when stuff happens in our lives. And what's is it really that wrong if you have a couple of hours of downtime that you didn't have to account for something or other on? Is it yeah. really that bad? Maybe it's good that we actually just get back to sit and go. Okay, I'm yeah. just going to think. Yeah, I'm going to just don't even have to watch TV. You don't even have to do anything. I'm yeah. just going to sit and be be. I love that. Yeah. Human beings. Yeah. You know, That's a, exactly. We call that for a reason. Yeah. That's it. I love totally. it. Totally. Amazing. Amazing. This is this is very powerful stuff indeed. So uh, I, I I need to wind up the story that you were telling us. It was not a story, your journey. Yep. You then transitioned from that amazing lifestyle into the role you do now. How, how did that how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so we're in we're uh, we're in the Middle East and yep. we've done five and five or so years at this time it's hard work yeah. you know look i loved every minute of it but it was really hard work i was uh i was on call all the time you know and my kids were growing so by this stage my children are 12 10 something around so how many here. years were you there for five, about five years oh, five okay yep. wow yep. so my kids are now coming up to high school yes just the oldest was starting to come to high school and um my wife had uh, her her grandmother had passed away, yes. and um, my father had got unwell. And you start realizing that you're a long way away from family. Okay, and right. you know you, you kind of think to yourself, um, "Wow, if something does happen to Dad or something like this, I'm a long way away." Uh-huh. And so we just felt the calling to come home to Australia, yep. and that's what we thought: home to Australia. Never thinking it was going to be Tasmania, mm-hmm. and we'd never been here and ended up here in Tasmania. I worked for Ambulance Tasmania Yes, and really enjoyed that time. But then after about, uh, and then started just coming to the church here at C3, uh, just just attended. We just came in, sat in the chairs, served, did what we did and just enjoyed it. About four years into that, um, we, was, we felt called and were called to, do you want to step into some form of leadership? Okay. And so I, I, prayed about it and yeah. spoke about it with my wife and took leave without pay for 50% from my ambulance role. Wow. And so maintained my accreditation and, and credentialing and stuff, but then took 50% leave and started just working in leadership here. Um, at the same time as the current leaders transitioned out, which I didn't know about. Oh my goodness. And so I was all of a sudden wow. going from, no, not just this, actually we want you to lead the place. I was like, oh, that was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> But hey, God had it. And yeah. Wow. And yeah. you had become a pastor before. Like, at what stage? Did no. Well, that so happen? so it was sort of like all of a sudden. So it's a little bit different in in, in the movement we're in. Yeah. You're not sort of you don't go to pastor school. You can. You okay, can do right, theological training. Yes. You, you can. Um, and and it's very helpful. Yeah. But uh, it was about really it was about leading a church. I see. Yes. So so yes, your term is a pastor, and and I'm ordained by our movement, mm-hmm. but I didn't do a degree in theology yes some people do absolutely yeah. they do my wife's doing a degree in theology or doing Amazing. a master's in, yeah, in, wow. in theology wow but for me it was about leading leading a team and a lot of the time in the church it is leading a team we had a great team here we still got a great team here yeah and it was about leading them and helping them and you know because when you're leading a church especially the church sort of our size here you're you're kind of got to be the ceo the coo you know the CFO. You know yes. you got to you got to be able yeah. to deal all of these things because you've got to be a good steward with people's finances. Yeah. You know because you're, you know you've got a youth program that's running this. You've got a kids program, so you've got to have good governance around what you're doing with the kids program. Mm-hmm. You've got to have um, making sure are your youth leaders empowered. Uh, we use the term, we use the term empowered, encouraged, and equip, which is what we do to our leaders. I love that. We want to empower yeah. them. We want to equip them with the resources they need, and we want to encourage them in the job they're doing. Yes. Yes. And so, so ultimately, I saw myself certainly in those first few years of just steadying the ship and just creating some leadership for some of the great things that were already here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we do good worship, you know, good music. I don't yeah. play, yeah. so it's not like I'm up there doing it, but it's about making sure are they equipped as a team? 
Yes. Are they healthy as a team? Do they have a good leader that's helping them? Are they, you know, in a good place? And so a lot of the time my role is that and then pastoring, preaching the word. Of course. Yeah. My goodness, that's phenomenal. And and obviously, like on top of that, you could say that, like you said, a lot of people are coming here for, they're they're really seeking that support, Mm. which in and of itself can be, like I'm a coach, I, I know sure. what it's like when you're there for people and you're helping them process the emotional side of things mm-hmm. and that that is that's added on top. So what do you do to take care of yourself and stay in a because you know you look <laughs> incredibly healthy and <laughs> you know great question. Great question. Yeah. Uh, and there's two elements to that. Yeah. I do physically I try and keep relatively fit. Yes. Uh, relatively. Yeah. Yeah. So I think to me, it's about keeping keeping fit when we use the term fit, but keeping healthy physically. Yes. But also keeping healthy uh, mentally. Yeah. When I was an ambulance, Nash, I used to, before every single shift, I would pray a very simple prayer. Lord God, watch over me physically and mentally. Mm. Very simple, that. before every shift. Because... Sure, you're traveling in an ambulance at 180 kilometers an hour, oh, yeah, or jumping, jumping out of helicopters. Yes. I was all of these things. So physically, I, I, you know, God protect me in these situations. I was, you know, you're, you're placed at murder scenes. You're doing all sorts of stuff. So yeah, of protect course. me physically, but I was also protect me mentally mm-hmm. because you saw some stuff that you know I don't think as humans we're designed to see. For sure, and. People often say to you, you know, what's the worst job you ever want to? And they want this really gory yeah. story. And, yeah. and and often it's not. It's a cumulative effect of thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. And I'll often say to somebody, the most challenging job I ever went to was, you know, a poor old grandmother who's fallen down a back step and hasn't been found for two days. Yeah. You know, who's, who's in the backyard crying in pain. Mm. And they're like, that's not gory. Yeah. No, but that means something to her. And it's a cumulative effect. So it was like, Lord God, just protect my mind. Mm. And I think it's the same in, in our life now today. Is it? Is it? I think we need to keep ourselves fit and healthy. Watch That's what we eat. Do yeah. those things. You know, yeah. you, you're the coach in this. You know, but yeah. do those things. Yeah. But we need to be paying for protection of to to watch over our minds and our, and our, our spirits. Mm. And for me, um, that's in the scriptures. It's in the Bible. Yeah. So I read the Bible. Yes. Because it, it brings life. It brings, it's the manual of life to me. Mm, I love that. You know, it talks about, you know, like I talked before about things around pride and and stuff like that and areas in my life. So I would just start reading the scriptures of of, um, King David in the Old Testament. You know, how did he break through these things? You know, some of the New Testament stories. But it's the manual of life. That's what it's designed to be. Yes. And so for me, there's no greater element than to, to read the word and just speak to my father in heaven god mm. protect my mind protect my soul protect me physically yeah um and then get the rest create the margin and do those things i love that i don't always get it right no of course of course <laughs> don't always yeah. get it right that's right we're all works in progress yeah. which is awesome um i love that so i guess what what like the language i'd use with my audience that they're familiar <laughs> with it's setting intention before you do things having a, a grounding yourself in an mm-hmm. intention and what you're asking for protect the mind and the body mm-hmm. like that's that's a very clear cut direction for you then to head as well like so sure. that's going to give you as, as we say subconscious or, or, or a mental command that you'll then start moving in that direction a little bit more too totally. so totally. You know, for people who aren't spiritual and you're what well, everyone's spiritual i, I, I sure. believe yeah, yeah yeah but you know people who don't necessarily practice this mm-hmm. stuff yep um just the power of having that intention to yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be in this i've got responsibility here but i'm also going to have the intention that i'm going to protect my mind i'm going to be on guard i think that in itself i love is that very, word very powerful. Yeah. i love let me give you an example with this um i'm a fairly disciplined person yeah. uh yeah sometimes yeah. sometimes in my eating you know yeah it's but, good you've got that little flex yeah yeah, yeah. there's yeah. parts of me yeah so so but for me, my time is in the morning. I love yeah. sort of waking up five, that sort of thing Amazing. there. And I just yeah. take my time. The house is generally quiet. Yeah. And I just get my time. For me, my time of reflection is getting into the word or just even just sitting and just, just being and just, you know, yeah. a cup of coffee, doing those sort of love things that. there. 
I found um, certainly in the early days of, of COVID, when COVID first broke, we're talking, you know, what, 14, 15 months ago now, yeah. I would be getting up and the first thing that I'd do, I'd go to my phone and I'd be going, how many cases overnight? Where was this broken? Where yeah. was these things doing? Yeah. And so all of a sudden, what had I, this culture I'd created in my mind of just creating space, you know, like getting into the scriptures, praying, doing these things here, had been overtaken by by news. And, and yeah. most of that was bad news, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, these people were people dying. A thousand percent. This, this yeah. was tough, right? Yeah. And so all of a sudden, I had gone, and, and my intention all of a sudden then, I knew what I wanted to do, but I had been totally overtaken. And I, I pulled myself up after a couple of months going, this is not healthy for me. Mm. Because then I'm still waking up at the in the morning but by 5 30 or by six o'clock i've read 75 different you know news versions of what's happening where all this sort of stuff i don't know what to believe what not to believe and and i created in my own mind i sensed in my own mind that i created anxiousness and and i was i was just apprehensive and what i'd also done is i then hadn't put god first Mm. because i'd all of a sudden put all these other things first and then i was like oh hang on have i got time for you god now i've got to get into the day and so you're, I had my intention had to go be back and go, right, I'm going to be intentional and get up and go, that news will still wait. Yes. Put my phone away, put the computer away, yeah. whatever it might be, yeah. that will still be there in an hour's time. I love that. I need to create in myself something first. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. I, I am a massive advocate for morning routines. That's one of the biggest things I support people do is create a rock solid morning routine. And the interesting thing is people who follow my work know I'm a bit of a nerd for the body and the mind and yep. cortisol is naturally high. The fear stress hormone is naturally high in the morning. So it's almost like we're being invited, called to do something to reduce totally. that cortisol. It's like the body's almost begging you to do that if, if you look at the science of, of what the body's doing first thing in the morning. So it's like, it's almost, it, it's, it's a beautiful invitation to take some time in the morning and, and drop that, mm-hmm. ground yourself in prayer in mindfulness. I you you talked gone. about it before, and, and you've got a wide range of viewers here. Um, I believe everybody's on a faith journey somewhere. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. We're, we're not all at a level because the reality is we're all imperfect. We're yeah. all broken. We're all sinners. We're all busted up. Yeah. We're all on a faith journey somewhere. And so I just, I just encourage, you know, whatever that is to you, you might sit there and say, I've never prayed to God. That's kind of weird. You don't have to be some articulate orator, you know, mm. some, so it's, it's simply just talking. It's yes. just, maybe for you, it is just sitting and just, just meditate. And I'm, maybe that's not, maybe it is going for a walk. Some mornings for me, I just grab the dog, wake him up early and we'll just go for a walk. Yeah. Because that's, that's an element of just, whew, I feel good. A thousand percent. Just yeah. a couple of Ks, feel good. Dog feels good, you know? Yeah. 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 That's, that's gold. Amazing. Amazing stuff. The, question that's really on my heart to ask you is who is god for you or, or what is god mm-hmm. for you like how do you conceptualize yeah, great question god great question is it a person i'm fascinated yeah yeah to me to me it is a person okay so yes. so my, my simplistic view with this and, I, and i'm not going to go all preachy on this but my simplistic view on this is is god the father created the earth yes okay this is my understanding my beliefs this is what i teach yeah, beautiful. god the father created the earth he sent his son jesus christ in humanly form to be on earth with us because the reality is is that when god created the earth sin came into the world and we were broken mm. that's that's it we're actually born sinners yeah i'd like to sit there and we think to ourselves babies are born you know these perfect creatures well they might look innocent, but, but yeah. you know we're, we're born broken. Yeah. And so we're, we're kind of like we're behind the starting line right from the word go. Mm-hmm. God recognizes this and he says, I want to correct this. So he sends his son Jesus into the world in human form. He lived on the earth 2,000 years ago. If you believe the Bible, that's what he says. He lived on the earth 2,000 years ago. And he, what he did in that time is he set up a ministry and he showed people um, what it was to be with his father in heaven yeah. you know he showed yeah. what it was to be in reconnection so what he did is he ended up dying on the cross and he took our brokenness and our sins and all of that stuff and and when he died on the cross and then rose again uh effectively death was defeated now i'm not talking in the physical term mm-hmm. we, we will pass yes okay 
but but he that that death of the sin and stuff was taken and i'm also not saying that we won't sin again mm-hmm. all right but what we do is i rest in the fact that that i i live a life according to what i try to i'm gonna sin but yeah. i've got forgiveness in my life and i seek forgiveness in my life then it says really clearly in the scriptures in in the book of acts it says in there that jesus's time on earth was done he went up to be with his father in heaven and then he sent um the spirit the holy spirit to be with us yes people really don't understand because we can't see it i can't reach out yeah. and grab it yeah but then again i couldn't reach out and grab jesus either because i wasn't there two thousand yeah. years can't ago grab electricity either that's that's yeah, right exactly. you yeah, can't yeah. grab the wind yeah you yeah. know you can't do these things but you yeah. can see the effects of it that's the spirit to me is in the bible it's often termed as our helper mm. our comforter our advocate and, and we use the term a lot of the time, you know, that gut feeling I've got? Yeah. It's actually the spirit moving in you are saying, you know, hey, just moving these things. It's that comforter inside of you, that, is, that, that healer, that, that advocate. Yeah. And so simplistically, that's the way I live my life. And it, it's a faith life. It has to be because yeah. I don't have Jesus sitting next to me. You know, I, I've got to believe inside of myself that he, he died on the cross, that the Bible is what it says it is. Uh, so it's a faith journey. Yes. But don't we live a lot of our life in faith? We sit on a chair here knowing that it's going to, you know, hold our weight and that's do right. these things. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what it is for me. And at the end of the day, Nash, if it's all a big joke and I've got it wrong, well, then I'm okay to yeah. be said you got it wrong. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if it is as I believe it is and I haven't got it wrong, I want that eternity, mm-hmm. not the opposition. And, and that's what it is for me. Yeah, I love that. Amazing answer. That's I'm letting that sink in. So, what about someone who? Because I, I, the thing that's I'm, I'm noticing massively in the world right now is people are like, "What do I believe in? Mm-hmm. And how do I know if it's true?" Mm-hmm. Which is fair enough, given because sure. there's been a lot of lies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for people who are like, "Okay, well, this sounds well and good, but how do I know if I can trust it?" Is it, does it come back to what you said there where it's just like, well, what's the alternative? T- to- totally, yeah. to- okay. totally. And, and, and look, the alternative is, is we're gonna put our trust in something. True. Yep. We're going to. And, and that trust can be in, in uh, worldly goods, finances, you know, crypto if you wanna, I'm not against it, but, yeah. but you know what I mean? We can, we can put our trust into whatever is out there. Uh, at the end of the day, that's going to that can fail you as much as anything else yeah you know whatever it is out there is that is humanly made is can fail you and so it comes down to this faith and 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 my faith is in the understanding that that god created me he sent his son to die on the cross in order to take my brokenness doesn't mean i'm perfect because i'm not perfect it means that i will sin again but i've got forgiveness and that i've got eternal life with him Mm. um the alternative to me doesn't bear to speak about you know i and, and so why did I go from the world I had as a critical care paramedic? Often people ask me. Mm. I was a highly trained critical care paramedic. I was a clinical director. Yeah. I was one of the youngest ever in Australia at the time to wow. do it. Uh, why would I go from that? And that brought about a good, a good salary and stuff for like sure, that. For sure, for sure. Um, why would I go from that to pastoring a church? Because I want those around me to have what I've got inside of me. I've got a hope inside of me doesn't mean that I don't have tragedies in my life. We've had personal, my wife and I have had personal griefs where we've lost family members yes. um, in our, you know, close family members. Uh, we've had personal griefs, we've, we've had challenges, we have hurdles all the time, but I have a hope. And so I just want others to have that. And I love when people walk in the door, um, whether they're, as I said before, a CEO of a billion dollar company or whether they got out of jail six weeks ago yeah most people are looking for hope a thousand percent they're not looking for money that's yeah. just a side product they're not looking for these things they're, not, they're looking for hope yes. and you know i believe that the message we've got is a message of hope and the way we do it through our church structure here is building community and relationship because when you're having a tough day you say hey man it's all right i'll get around you yeah because then you hold up my arms on another day and and that's what that community feel is about. Yeah. So good. So good. 
I ask all my guests this question. If you had one minute on every single social media platform, so you, Mark Zuckerberg or whoever mm -hmm. runs them gives you access for mm -hmm. one minute, everyone is watching and you would free reigns for a minute, what's the message you'd want people to hear? Wow, that is a great question. No pressure. Yeah, that is a great question. That is a great question. I think my message would be, um, my message would be is, is place your faith. Now, hang on, let me think about this. This is a really good question. I've never been asked that question good, before. I'm glad. Never been asked that question before. <laughs> I hoped it was my own, so let's Yeah, go. yeah, no, I love that one. <laughs> yeah. Love that one. Uh, it, it, it has to be, it have to be the message of, of hope for people, which yeah. I've talked about. It yeah. has to be. be. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, I would have to frame a minute around saying that, that you know, you can put your trust in anything else out there. Yeah. Uh, and, and you might get through to the end of the day and, and you feel successful and do all of these things. But that's not what the world is built on. The world is built on, on, on how, what hope have I got? You know, what is my eternity when mm. I'm gone? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think my thing would be is going, um, yeah, where do you rest your eternity? What are you yeah. going to do in eternity? Yeah. And, and get people, maybe in that one minute, I'd get people to question going, what, what do you want to be remembered for? What, do, what is in your eternity? Mm. Uh, yeah. I love that. So live, live like your actions will be echoed. For Absolutely. Eternity. That's, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. love that. What, um, there's an old rabbinical saying of, um, that there was those who, uh, what is it? Those who planted trees in whose shade they will never sit. Mm. Mm. And I, I love that thing. Or, you know, it's, it's about that little thing of what we do today will echo into eternity. Yes. And, yes. you know, what we plant today will echo into eternity. I, I love that, that yes. thinking of, you know, what we may never see, the seeds we sow into people's lives now, the things we do as a church, the things we do in society and stuff like that, we may never get to sit under the great oak trees that they are, but I hope that what we do will bring that peace, that joy, that hope to somebody else who, that, who does get to. I love that. Yeah, yeah, amazing. There you go. Beautiful. What about, okay, last question. This is, this is going to be our last question because I want to respect your time. <laughs> I could chat to you. Hours, <laughs> by the way. Um, do you believe everyone on earth has a purpose? Because this is a Thoughts on Purpose podcast. People mm -hmm. come here to find and connect with more sense, a greater sense of purpose. Do you believe everyone on earth has a, has a purpose? Yep. Yeah. Purpose-driven life. Yeah. I encourage your, your viewers. There's a book called A Purpose-Driven Life by Rick Warren. Uh -huh. Great great book by there. I believe everybody. God created, it says very clearly in the start of the scriptures, it says God created, uh, created us in his image. Yes. Now, if he's creating us in his image, we have to have a purpose, right? Absolutely. We have to have yeah. a purpose. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've been in the medical game for 20 years. Is there some stories that bring tears to my eyes? Absolutely. I've seen some of the toughest, hardest stories. I've, I've been in some of the toughest situations that I said I've prayed mentally to be able to be prepared for them. And I've seen how some of the most disadvantaged physically, mentally, whatever it might be, have brought purpose to somebody else's life. Yeah. And, and so absolutely, uh, I believe we have a purpose-driven life. Yeah. And I believe that uh, my prayer is that we can reach as many people with, with the hope that is found in Christ, but you have a purpose. You have a purpose to be able to, to bring that hope to others, yeah. to bring, to bring that, that goodness to others. And yes. to, you know, yeah, so absolutely. Amazing, amazing. How can people get in contact with you? Like if people look at this and they're like, I want to come and find out more about what you've got going on, what's the best way to get around you yeah i mean i guess from a church sense it's just um at c3 hobart yeah uh, c3 church hobart on, yes. we're on web we're on um instagram we're on all of the all of the socials yeah um, c3 church on instagram as well is it yep c3 yep, church yep. is on instagram okay. yep. yep c3 Good. church hobart you'll find it there um it's we're on all the instagram on all, all the socials there um personally my you know sean white um, I'm on Instagram there. Yep. Not the not the snowboarder because you, you'll get the snowboarder. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, to see part of my life yeah. and what I'm doing there. But yeah. you know, we, we're on YouTube too. Every every week, our my preachers will go on YouTube oh. and people will be able to see those things as yeah. well. But love people to be able to contact. Amazing, Sean. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show, mate. What an honour, man. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, guys.